you more of an overview of kind of uh, kind of the big rocks and kind of what we expect to, to cover over the next several weeks. And I also want to just kind of address kind of why some of you may be in here for different reasons, and that's okay. Um, and so with that, uh, oh, that fan's open a lot already. With that, the different reasons is going to, um, the reason that you're in here may change what you do with what we learn together over the course of the next several months. This class will run through the end of January, so 13 weeks. Um, gives us kind of a buffer week there around Christmas, Thanksgiving, and we need to catch up on certain things or whatnot. So, um, so we will um, we'll run through the end of January, and um, yeah, so I'm already getting ahead of myself, so let me, let me slow down, and let's do first things first, and go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then um, to our exercise, and we'll kind of go from there. So, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here this morning to learn about how you've called us to live as disciples, and that is to make other disciples that are growing and that are mature. And certainly, there are more than uh, there is more than one way to approach this, and there are many, many godly men and women who have gone before us and who have laid uh, a good and strong foundation. And so, anything that we've talked about over the course of the next, these next several months. Uh, it, it is as a result of learning or standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. Ultimately, the apostles in your word and um, what we see in the New Testament. But even in our day and age, those who have practiced these things and from whose lives and experience we are able to learn. So I pray that uh, through our shared experience that you would help us to be instructed and helpful to one another. Pray that you would give us a clear vision for um, for how we can love others to become mature and quick followers of Christ at Oak Grove Church. And so we uh, give this time to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, hey, Phyllis, come on in. Hey, Sherilyn. There's, there's seats up here that the folks in the back were, were selfless to save for you right up front. All right. So, Pastor yeah. Dan, do you have a handout for us to take notes on? Oh, yes. <laughs> but I just haven't handed it out yet. <laughs> I do, I do. Uh, I'll hand it out here in just a minute. But first, what I'd like you to do is, I need, uh, let's see, how many people have? Three, five, seven, nine, 16. So let's go ahead and break up into three groups, or you can do this by tables. Now let's just do three groups. So if you uh, have the sheet of paper, you're the captain of your group. <laughs> and you have to give a presentation at church. So there. Who's group number two? I'll just... There we go. And you can hang... I would hang that on the wall. Maybe you guys can collect around that. I'll put one on this table. And then... You can grab one more. Okay. All right, here we are. Okay, now, I am going to give you, uh, yeah, it's for you guys can write some onto the wall. Or I'll be there. Here you guys are. Just make sure that doesn't actually go through onto the wall. Or I'll be that means you're the right one. Okay, so here's your challenge. Here's your challenge to, to design a discipleship pathway for somebody that comes to Christ and is a part of a church that, let's say you're planting a church and you get to design it however you want. Somebody comes from, um, they become a Christian and in the course of whatever you decide on your little pathway, they are going to become a mature and equipped follower of Christ. That phrase does not equal a perfect Christian, let's be clear, but a mature and equipped follower of Christ. I'm going to give you five minutes, so you don't have to detail everything, but you've got five minutes. Do you, do you understand the test? No pressure. What? No pressure. Yes. It is pressure. <laughs> yes. So you adjust your pressure. Here you go. You ready? To design a discipleship pathway, and that's the key, a discipleship pathway 
where someone can go from becoming a brand new Christian to becoming a mature and equipped follower of Christ. Got it? Okay, you got five minutes. Go. You've never seen me right. I've seen myself right. Come back together here. And what I'm going to do is just have each group, we're going to have each group take a minute, and we're going to just real quickly, right? Uh, we all acknowledge the inadequacy of time that you had to put this together and that you have to present it. So just take literally one to two minutes, no more than two, and just kind of walk us through what you have uh, designed as a group. So who would like to go first? We will. <laughs> all right. So you have your salvation in the new Christian. I'm going to take them in a group of believers in their church body. You want to get them involved in the church, church believers. Okay. You go in on a one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to connect with them, fellowship with them. And then you're going to send them into a mentorship, someone older in faith, hopefully somebody in the church, we can always get them into like a small group, individual time with them, and have deliberate teaching and study of the Word of God and a deliberate life together, getting to know them and um, letting, me help, letting them know how to be authentic, the goods, the bads, what's going to happen, how do you... How do you get them out of that? But, but that's not to be, and just be friend them at that time. Let them know it's okay, we, we'll just learn from it. And then hand them off. Say, okay, here you go. We need to venture out, let them go. To? To doing um, discipling show. And letting them go get their church and, and grow it. Finding their growth. Okay. okay, so this is the new believer. Who's being handed off here? I just want to understand. We're letting the new believer kind of, we're going to watch over after, right? after they're, they gone right. through this. But well, this is a new believer, we're going to hand them off to letting them go to an area where they, the they grow, to start the process of the growth. So, and then we have the discipleship trying to get Okay. I'm not just trying to like, I'm sorry, kind of like, tell me Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 They're mature. Yeah. So they can be they're, Okay, together. so to disciple yeah. someone yeah. else. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. This group over here. Good job, by the way. Good job. Mm -hmm. This group over here, somebody jump I up. wrote and she wrote, so it's up to you guys. Teamwork down there?
uh, do life together with grace, love, and prayer. And as we do all of that, not help them. And don't let them feel like they're pressured through that hole. Okay. What do you mean by don't let them feel like they're pressured? Pressured to... Well, just keeping them, you know, Okay, you gotta do this, gotta do this, Perform. gotta do this. Okay. To perform. So like a performing? Good. Okay, okay, not so that they're not performing. performing. Right. Mix of that balance between God grace and and truth. Uh, truth and grace and Okay, all right, good. I forgot to put one on ours. Teach them that this is a reproducible process. Okay. You know, that now that you know this, then what do you do with it? Yeah. Because that's I think where a lot of us Christians got stuck. Right. Yep. Is okay. Yeah. We Don't have all this it. knowledge. We have all these like identify these, and then now what? Like, uh -huh. oh, yeah, that discipleship thing. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be doing. Yep. Yep. That's right. That's right. Um, when uh, I had a, a meeting with our worship and tech team yesterday, and introduced a music and worship ministry handbook to them. And we talked a little bit about why why a handbook? Why not just, you know, do your best and we're going to look to the Word and leave it at that. Like, why put it on paper? Well, we've talked a lot, and churches typically talk a lot about wanting to be sure that we're discipling at every level. Well, if we're going to be discipling at every level, it needs to be something that's reproducible, which means you have to make some decisions to include some things and not to include some things just because you can you know that you can only accomplish so much in a given time. Or, as you know with the telephone game, right, uh, what gets told to one person gets told to someone else and often not very far down the line it can be something entirely different, right? But even in discipleship, thankfully with the Word of God, we've got that in writing. But if a church, an organization, is seeking to uh, make mature and equipped followers of Christ. And when I say make, anytime I use the word make, I always mean in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. I just won't say that every single time. So just know, you know, make new Christians. God makes new Christians. We're part of the process, right? We, we can't make somebody become a follower, of, a mature and equipped follower of Christ. They have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in that process. So there's my disclaimer anytime I say that. But... As we seek to make mature and equipped followers of Christ, as we see, uh, I, I think if you guys had a weekend with no uh, distractions and the Word of God, you could take each of these processes and flesh them out much further, if you had time, into a process that then could go into a development, uh, a development phase uh, that could turn into a curriculum, a process curriculum of sorts. Does that make sense? Right? What's consistent, I think, about each of these is there's a combination of, obviously there's spiritual gifts that we're seeing here, right? You've got things like prayer and discipling and things like that. So there's relationship. But there's also content. And so as we begin to talk about life-on-life -life missional discipleship, what we're seeking to do is bring a, a lot of content into a process that can be used to transfer that content, but it's also not just content. There's a product. There's a life product. Now, when, when Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, implicit in what he's saying is, I have a certain life product of being a faithful follower of Christ. It sounds a little haughty. I know it. There's the tendency to push back, like, oh, I haven't arrived yet. Praise the Lord that you want to say that. But it's not wrong to say, here's where I'm growing in my faith. And here's where you can follow me. You can follow me as I follow Christ. I'm not saying be just like me. I'm not saying take the bad with the good. I'm saying take the good, kick out the bad, where, and go to Scripture on these things. But I'm growing too. But as I'm growing, as I'm going hard after Jesus, come along with me. Let me walk with you. Let me journey with you. And let me teach you some things that you need to know. If you own a business and you are training somebody to take over that business, you are not going to spend one day a week with them for an hour and a half 
and then in a year say, it's all yours. You can do this to train up the next business owner. Nobody in their right mind would do that. And so it is with um, the Christian faith. And we're all in this room because we know this. And in my experience, when I, when I, I graduated high school as a fairly immature to moderately mature, more fairly immature <laughs> young man. I took a gap year and I sold cars for a year. I went like this in my relationship with God in 12 months. Unbelievable. It was unreal. Um, and God is so gracious and kind. I went to college and moved out of Tennessee. And I kind of figured out where things were for about a year. Uh, from where my college was to churches, things like that. After about a year, I got settled in Mill Springs Baptist Church, which was a church of about 80 country church, and in the span, right around the time that several of us began going to this church, the, 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 about um, 90 college students started coming. Uh, this pastor, Rusty, who has uh, been a mentor for many, many years, um, uh, unfortunately not doing well with the Lord right now, but um, was a mentor for many, many years. He was a passionate preacher of God's Word. I learned what I learned about expository preaching way before I went to seminary, and I'm not knocking seminary, I love my seminary years, but I learned it from Rusty. People say, well, why do you preach? Why do you have a, mostly a manuscript? Why do you? I'm just saying I learned it from that guy. His preaching so affected me that it became largely how I preach and teach even today. Um, and so he marked me, but not only did he preach in such a way that it gripped me and many other students, like the church did not know what to do with all these college kids. <laughs> they, I mean, seriously, they, did, they were like, uh, <laughs> we got nothing. Uh, they didn't have a program, they didn't have anything. And they even wrestled with, do we want all these kids? They're a drain on our resources. Well, it's true. Many churches have this conversation. They're a drain on our resources. We don't have the money to X, Y, and Z. They're not tithing. I mean, they're college kids. For crying out loud. They don't have anything to tithe even, you know, and all of this sort of stuff. But a handful of people, five to eight people in the church said, fought for young people. And they said, we've got to figure it out. Otherwise, we're not being faithful to the Lord Jesus. And so they did, and they figured it out, and, and they developed a, this, what very quickly turned into a Sunday school class. And my friend Mark, who's a pastor up in New England right now, uh, or in Massachusetts, um, discipled me for six or seven years. And there's a picture that I'll show you probably next week. There are a group of about seven of us, eight of us, um, that meet together. You've heard me talk about this group of guys from Tennessee I have to get together with every year. Uh, down in, or most years, down in uh, Tennessee. As a matter of fact, they're getting together next weekend. I won't be there this year, but uh, these are all friendships that were formed in an accountability discipleship group uh, 20 years ago when I was in college. Because someone discipled us very, very intentionally. And today, still, we're getting together. We have a text thread. Just ask Cheryl. She's like, that thing beeps constantly. It's most of the time, it's this group of guys that I grew with in the faith. Um, and so most of us would acknowledge this process is part process, it's uh, content, and um, what we wrestle to do, though, is as an organization, as a church, say, we're going to adopt this pathway, this process to help a believer go from becoming a brand new baby Christian to a mature and equipped follower of Christ. Does that make sense? We can talk, but it's, we are having this conversation about things that are very, very difficult to reproduce. And if we're going to become effective in it, we have to identify and adopt a process. Does it mean it's the best process uh, out there? No, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, there are areas where I will take some, um, you know, some criticism of it. As if, if I wrote something uh, with this Music and Worship Ministry Handbook, I said, as we aim to involve new people in the ministry, we must disciple them. But we need to have something to work off of if you're going to disciple someone. And so this gives us a something to work off of as we begin to talk about it. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. As the Lord brought me into ministry, what I wrestled with was the, the, the vast number of events that churches had. And the ineffectiveness of 
those events of the cumulative, cumulative effect of those events to make mature and equipped followers of Christ. And I didn't know what to do with that. I was introduced to this process of life on life missional discipleship, or you'll hear me call them interchangeably journey groups. It's different from the journey groups we've had here, and that's not a knock on those journey groups. They're wonderful things. And in large part, they aim for the same general ideas. But one of the guys who was on my worship band moved from New Jersey down to Kentucky, and in a matter, I went down to visit him. I was at a conference, and I went down to visit Keith. In a matter of spending a couple days with him, I, I, I just looked at him at one point, and I said, Keith, what happened to you? He said, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? I said, what? what you, I mean, you were growing when you were serving in our church up in, in, in New Jersey, but you, you, you found the right Kool-Aid, and you drank it. What happened? And he said, our church has this phenomenal discipling process. And I said, tell me everything. That began a journey in my life where I, I went down to what they call a transformation clinic to learn the, the overview of this. Then I went back and I talked with our church staff about it. And my pastor, who is also my brother-in-law, thought uh, what many people would legitimately think. It's just another program. And I, which is what I thought at first. And I said, I, 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 I literally begged. I just said, please, please. And so he didn't come, but he said, I'm going to send you and Bob to go down for the next one. So we went down to the next clinic. And this church was trying to do life on life discipleship with churches as much as possible. So you couldn't go to the second workshop unless you went to the first workshop, etc. So Bob and I came back and said, we have to come. We have to bring our elders down. So then the next clinic, which was a few months later, a team of eight or nine of us from our church, elders and staff all went down and Everybody said, oh, it's not just a program. Are there programmatic aspects to it? Sure. Um, but it's discipleship via process, not only information. Information is a part of it, but we have to develop and design a process where we can help people take someone along. And so that's essentially what these journey groups are. As we talked at a, an elders retreat that we had in August, um, we talked long and hard about discipling. There's no question that we as a church want to disciple. That's why this room is pretty full of people who want to make disciples or get into a position where you can learn how to grow in areas where you know you need to so that one day you can lead and make more disciples. And so uh, we said this is slow growth. This is not a quick fix. Church isn't going to be like turned around, not that it needs to be turned around, but I mean, you know, uh, in six months. This is a years long <laughs> commitment to seeing a couple of groups begin. And then a year later, one or two more. And then a year later. So, this, you see where I'm going with that? Our goal, and you're not going to hear it, we've talked about it publicly a lot to, for, in coming into this class. But this may be the only class like this that I ever teach here. This may be the only class like this that we ever have. Because the idea is that the leadership will come out of existing journey groups. One or two maybe this year. I mean, you know, we've, we're, we're, we've begun one group now that Sherilyn has started with a handful of ladies. And we're, we're aiming at the end of this class to maybe begin one uh, probably a maximum of two ladies group and probably two men's groups. Now, we have a problem with that right out of the gates where we feel like, oh, we can't involve everybody right away. Not everybody is ready for this. It doesn't mean they're not good enough. It doesn't mean they're not. It just means there's a significant uh, commitment of time that's required for this particular process. And so it may mean that somebody needs to uh, take some time to, to kind of clear some things in their life so that they have time to be able to devote to this well. Does that make sense? It's an intensive. It's an intensive. So I wrestled with this issue of we're doing all of these things, and they're good things. They're good, good things that we're doing in churches programmatically. But we're just not seeing the, the product, if you will, of mature and equipped followers of Christ ready to do the same in the lives of others. At least not enough. And so that's kind of where my journey began with this. I want to play a video for you that um, 
the, the transformation clinic that I was able to be a part of was when they were kind of fleshing all of these things out. And so it's neat for me to watch this video last year. I think they put it out in the last year or two. And um, it's really helpful. They talk about the missing middle in the church. So I want you to watch this video. Um, and yeah, and then we'll talk through a little bit. Why is it that countless churches excel at preaching and programs, but struggle to make mature and equipped followers of Christ? Churches typically go from preaching and teaching to deploying. We tell people what to do, then send them off to do it. But the problem with proclamational leadership is that it sends out believers who aren't yet trained and mature. It leads to discouragement, disillusionment, and disengagement. Jesus didn't direct and delegate. He discipled. He didn't merely inform his followers by sharing his knowledge. He transformed them by sharing his life and having them join in his ministry. Jesus modeled incarnational leadership, discipling his men, joining them in the trenches while preparing and coaching them to multiply and to be sent to the front lines. We call it life on life missional discipleship and we believe it's the missing middle in the life of the church, the center of the hourglass. Preaching, teaching, and small groups deliver great truth and create meaningful fellowship. But life-on-life -life missional discipleship equips us to go from belief to maturity, leadership, and impacting other disciples and the lost world. Without Christ-like discipleship, Christ followers cannot become kingdom leaders, and congregations can cherish the word, but can't change the world. Remember, when God wanted to build his church, he didn't send a program to implement. He sent a person to imitate. And the life that Jesus lived, the model he gave, was defined by life-on-life -life missional discipleship. Jesus shows us how to think big, start small, and go deep. He pursued a big vision for the world by selecting a small group of men and investing deeply in their lives. As Paul says, we share the gospel with you and our lives as well. This is the heart of discipleship. When people who are being conformed to Christ share their life, they pass on Jesus' life. The life of Christ leaves a legacy of generations and the gospel spreads around the world. That's why Life on Life missional discipleship groups are unlike traditional small groups. They focus on life transformation, not just fellowship or knowledge transfer. They're small, with four to six people who are carefully selected and highly committed, and they multiply. We make disciples who can go and make more disciple-makers. As each leader goes on to raise up more leaders, and those leaders raise more leaders still, the growth of the movement is exponential and explosive. This is not a novel idea or a quick fix. It's simply the way of Jesus. It's not a new method, but an old method with new people. Jesus said to go and make disciples of all nations. As we focused on life-on-life -life missional discipleship, the blessing has been profound. By God's grace alone, we're seeing life-on-life -life missional discipleship movements rise up throughout the United States and around the globe. Wherever God's plan is followed, we see new believers, new leaders emerging, and congregations impacting their families, neighborhoods, cities, and nations. Discipleship was Jesus' model, his method, his mandate, and his mission. There is no plan B. about designing a process uh, for discipling, it is very easy to look at a lot of books that are very helpful. Every one of these books um, are very helpful in discipleship and how to disciple other folks. But it very, becomes very overwhelming very quickly. So what I want to do is look at a definition uh, and this is not on there. You don't have to write this on your sheet. Uh, there's not a specific... Well, there is, actually. Now that I think about it. Um, there is a... Let me just walk through this. So a disciple... A disciple is a world visionary... Sir. Yeah. I have one more. <laughs> oh. You guys need a pen, too? Oh, we got that. You got any more? 
more than one. Oh. <coughs> so a disciple is a, or I should say a Christian disciple, is a world visionary, world impacting, radically committed, follower, and learner, reproducer of Jesus Christ. This comes from Ken and Vaughn and the Downline Discipleship class that um, many of you in here just finished. A world visionary, world impacting, radically committed, follow, follower and learner, reproducer of Jesus Christ. This is one of many definitions. Really, this is more uh, about character traits and um, qualities. <coughs> now, what is life-on-life -life missional discipleship? It's this very kind of somewhat awkward phrase to continue saying, but I'm gonna, we're going to try to say life-on-life -life missional discipleship as much as we can so that it becomes embedded in our natural speak as part of, kind of the language of who we are as, as a church. Life on life missional discipleship is, so here we have the description of a Christ follower, right? Here we have a process. Laboring in the lives of a few with the intention of imparting, transferring one's life God's Word and the Gospel in such a way as to see them become mature and equipped followers of Christ committed to doing the same in the lives of of others. Laboring in the lives of the few with the intention of imparting one's own life, God's word and the gospel, in such a way as to see them become mature and equipped followers of Christ, willing to do the same in the lives of others. probably won't cover everything on your worksheet right there, but I just want to tell you, what I'm, the worksheet I'm working through right now is part of an orientation that Pastor Randy Pope of Perimeter Church walks through every year at his church when they uh, are training uh, those who are going to be leading journey groups. So this is his material, I just want to tell you. And let me answer one other question that you may have about this class. This class is going to be less of a Bible study, but more of a process of implementation. Our goal is to go from, and I want you to see how the Lord has been working here. We have been praying as elders for how to move forward in this direction and what it looks like. And as we began the last Sunday school class on downline discipleship, that came from Brian McLean, who was looking for the next Sunday school class. We knew we weren't quite ready for this yet, and so Brian sent it out to the elders and said, guys, what do you think about this? So I would love to say that for years we've been praying together about this exact process. And by the way, I said for years, I've just been here a year, but I'm not knocking any of our guys right now. I'm just saying, there are times when you just see God working. And you see the Lord putting pieces into place. And we're thankful for that because we say, wow, Lord, you're putting exactly where you're leading us into place. And so downline discipleship is, is probably the perfect class to precede this class. Because one of the things that you're going to notice, if you may remember, toward the end of your downline discipleship class, Ken and Vaughn talked about the discipleship blueprint. You remember that? He talked about the discipleship blueprint. Well, what was that discipleship blueprint? It wasn't laid out, and this is not a knock on Ken, because they actually have a, a web, website with some programming to help with these kinds of things. But it wasn't something that you could take and say, here is year one, here is your first year discipleship blueprint. 
it was a good description and a good definition, but leaves us wanting a little bit. And that's where journey groups can come in. Does that make sense? Uh, this is one year worth of curriculum over the course of 28 weeks. That typically takes, we say, two to three hours to complete outside of your group time. So we have individuals in here who are community group leaders. We have indiv individuals in here that are uh, just curious. How does Life on Life Mission or Discipleship or Journey Groups fit into our discipleship pathway? Because you see, what you guys wrote on your papers <clears throat> included small groups, community groups. It also included one-on-one -on -one discipleship and Bible reading. It included all of these things. Um, and so com I think community group leaders would say it's clear that community groups alone won't take someone from a new believer to being a leader able to equip other leaders alone. Community groups are very necessary. I like the uh, illustration of another pastor who says, by the way, I steal content all the time, so another pastor, who, I try to give credit where credit's due that when I can remember, but uh, another pastor who gives the illustration of a house. When you, when you walk into a house, you kind of have that foyer conversation. It's, it's somebody walks into your church and you begin just chit-chat. It's, it's, it's kind of the facts about life. That's really, you know, what did you do? Uh, it's, it's, it's fact transfer, right? Well, then you go from there, they take your coat, and you move into the living room. I equate the living room as, like, community groups. You're moving into the living room. You're going from facts. You're moving down a level in a good way, down, down in the layers of the heart to begin talking about how you're interpreting and responding to the facts of life. What is happening in your life? How can you pray for each other? And mutual care begins to happen in a community group environment. Often, there's not uh, one or more hours necessarily. I don't mean of your own personal devotion time, but of study time that the group is doing together to come back and massage into everyday life together. You come together, you watch a DVD study, or you go through another to study, and you discuss it, you spend time in prayer, and there's genuine, necessary mutual care happening. Life on Life Missional Discipleship aims to move from the living room to the dining room or the kitchen. You know when a friend comes over, and they come over enough times, we were over at uh, Edwards recently, and Teresa, Lindsay, uh, we were out chatting, and Teresa just kind of left the group and went in the kitchen, and she just started washing dishes. Life and life mission and disciples is when we all get in the kitchen and we're talking about, often what happens in that environment is maybe the host of, hostess of the house and somebody else is there, and you're washing dishes, and then you're talking about, like, okay, so really, how's this going? How are you doing? <coughs> and, and you're really getting into the meat of life. You've gone down another layer in the heart. And so Life on Life Mission or Discipleship aims to move us in that direction, right? At some point, there's a conversation that says, you know, I know that this part of life is hard, but you really need to, and there's an exhortation. And in Life on Life Mission or Discipleship, there is an exhortation. Um, I, I mentioned that we are going to talk largely about the process. There, there will be uh, content, hopefully, that if you're a community group leader or just a Christian friend, you can use in conversation with other people. So I don't want you to think, okay, if I'm not leading a group, or I'm not in a group, or I'm not planning to lead a group, then this class won't be helpful to me. That's not the end at all. I hope it'll be really helpful for everyone. Um, yeah. So, what do I want to say next? Let me just go on to, I'm going to just chase down a couple questions that are on your worksheet here. Who needs Life on Life Mission and Discipleship? Well, every believer. At some point in their spiritual journey, every believer needs this. When I was in college at Mill Springs Baptist Church, I did not go to Mill Springs looking for Life on Life Mission and Discipleship. In fact, we, they didn't use a process that was as well put together as this process is. But I grew because Mark Lukens and Rusty Webster invested in me. They gave me the ability to lead when I had no idea what I was doing. And I don't mean that they just put me out there and said, hey, good luck, pal. But I, I told the worship team this 
yesterday. I, the very first time I really led worship corporately, I led youth bands a lot and things like that, but leading corporate worship. And I tried to do things differently, you know, so I was trying to encourage people, you know, during the greeting time. We often go to the people that we're most comfortable with, right? And say, hey, how you been doing enough? And so I was thinking, how do I encourage people to go say hi to somebody that they don't know very well, you know? Just put this together a little phrase, right? So, instruments stop playing and I'm ready to say, my intent is to say, as the instrumentalist play, take a moment and shake the hand of an unfamiliar face, right? That was too much for me to say on the spot. Here's what came out. As the instrumentals, as the instruments play, take a moment and shake the face of an unfriendly person. <laughs> Here I am, Lord. Send me. Yep. Open the kingdom. So our piano player, who's a good friend, is dying over here playing piano. And I'm like, I love, you know. She says, did you hear yourself? I said, what are you talking about? Candace says, you said shake the face up. She told me what I said. I said, whatever, I did not. You're just trying to make fun of me. She goes, look. And I look out there. And a bunch of my sarcastic college buddies are out there going, hey, you're ugly. Can I shake your face? And walk around. <laughs> I mean. What's that? New technique. New technique, that's right. <laughs> While every believer needs life on life missional discipleship, and we begin to talk about, and we will talk about, what is required. This is not open to everyone. Pause, I know I got your attention there. That seems exclusive. Like a click. No? It is open to everyone who will make the commitment. What we are not willing to do and we'll talk about this more in the weeks to come. We're not willing to lower the bar of what's required in order to make it easier for everybody to become a part of this process. Because making mature and equipped followers of Christ requires certain disciplines. And this process helps develop those disciplines. So while there's a lot of work to be done in the week, we'll talk about this more, but there are three in-person meetings required in the process for inviting someone in to a group. And it's not until the fourth meeting, which can be a phone call, that you allow them to say yes. I've had this conversation many times where people have said after the first meeting, oh, it sounds great. Now the first meeting is often brief, and it's by casting a vision for it. Second meeting, you're sitting down and walking through the orientation guide which you have in your hands there. You, what you have there in this little booklet, by the way, is the orientation guide and two lessons. Okay, two weeks worth of lessons, just so you can kind of what's this look like? It's just so you can kind of see what it looks like. But um, another meeting is to meet with them and talk through it again. Ask if they have any questions. Also to invite their prayer through this entire process. And then in that, you know, sometimes third or fourth meeting, you're at that point then you're allowing people to say yes. But first meeting, second meeting, usually third meeting, we're not even allowing people to say, yes, I'm, I'll join a journey group. No, you need more time to pray to really count the cost and see if you're able. Because we want to help you succeed. All right? So, um, who is a qualified leader for a journey group? Well, one who genuinely is a faithful follower of Christ and who finds him or herself ahead of some others who will follow. So don't think of yourself as much as a group leader, but as a mentor or a disciple. And when we say don't think of yourself as a group leader, we're not saying group leaders are bad. We need group leaders. We need community group leaders. And often community group leaders um, are disciples and mentors. But we want to be real intentional here uh, in our language. Okay, and I'm going to stop there. We'll go through more of this uh, in the coming weeks. Let me tell you about what our aim is here together. The question I want to ask those of you who are in this room is this. Will you pray? Some of you guys are still right now answers, and that's 
fine. Keep, keep writing and getting finished out. Will you pray that God would use us to begin, or to continue, but to begin another layer of a discipleship movement at Oak Grove Church? And would you look at your calendar? Because at some point in time, in the next few months, I would invite you to come to a day of prayer. We're going to set aside eight hours, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for eight hours. It'll be directed prayer. There'll be some free time. Free time. There will be some time for you to just pray whatever's on your heart. There will be a lot of direction in it. So I know it seems like eight hours of prayer. Okay. We are, we are really going to be going after the Lord and asking the Lord to make this work. Because it has to be saturated in prayer. And when I talked with the service team a year ago, one of the things we talked about it is, about was uh, that by God's grace, I and we will have an unhindered, unfaded commitment to doing discipleship. Which will mean saying no to some other things. Good things. So that we can be disciple makers. So that we can raise up leaders in the church who will lead others. Why is it hard? Anybody can do it, honestly. With the commitment of the Holy Spirit, anybody can, can do this. With equipping, right? Doesn't mean anybody right out of the gates, first time, time, good luck. But genuinely, anybody can do this. If you're committed to following Jesus, Different people will have different levels, varying levels of success, of course, and that's okay. But when I had that conversation with the search team, I didn't know that downline discipleship was going to be a curriculum that was going to be chosen to be used. So my point is, we can have an intent, and we can be serious about that intent, and about that direction, about that effort. But it is going to be the Holy Spirit of God who will bring the pieces in place, who will give you an awareness of the people that are, that are around you as you live and work and play, where you interact with other people. Who does God keep putting in your life? I had a conversation about with someone recently, and they said, I mean, God just seems to be putting this person in my life over and over again. As a matter of fact, I've had three of them in the last two weeks. And so I'm going, okay, Lord. And I'm not even saying, oh, I, know, I think I know why. I don't know if that's what God's playing with, but I'm praying, okay, Lord, what, what might this be? So, so, look at your calendars and, and maybe identify several dates that would work for you. It may mean needing to clear some things in order to prioritize the day of prayer together. And I know with all of our schedules, it, we, we may, may pick a date that's not going to work for everybody, and I understand that. It doesn't mean that you know it's not going to work. But uh, I want to ask you to give that some serious thought this week. Maybe even next week we'll look at our calendars and even you know, put it out for the middle of December or you know, when we're not busy. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe we'll do for a second week in January. Maybe we'll do whatever. We'll find a time. Okay? Come next week at least with an intention to talk about that for a few minutes. Because we really are taking up God on his word that he will raise up a church, that God will build this church. No matter who comes or who goes, you know, I was thinking about the Corey's thing this week, and I've become dear friends with him in just a year, less than a year. Uh, and Steve really helped our transition here. And, you know, when, when someone leaves, especially someone that's a friend, you, you know, you start to oh, Lord, why, and ask all these questions. But, you know, God's promises to build his church are dependent on any one of us in this room, every one of us is a movable piece in God's plan. And we should rejoice in that. 
So let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you guys for joining us in this. I think this is going to be a great several weeks as we journey.